Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Steiner Sports. Uh, I saw most of you, or many of you, walking through the offices, and obviously, when you see Steiner Sports and you go onto the website and you see the signs at the stadiums, it really obviously doesn't give you a full breadth of what we actually do and you know the amount of excitement and fun we have. You know, just recreating these great moments. Uh, the two people that are with us tonight is Bucky Dent and Mike Therese, who basically are always going to be a part of uh, Yankee and Red Sox history. So it is with great pleasure that uh, we brought them in to see how tan they are. They didn't come from uh, <laughs> they, didn't, they, didn't, they, they didn't come from Riverhead. So uh, you know, obviously that's uh, part of the uh, ball player life and the traveling. Uh, so what we're going to do is we are going to uh, get some questions and really how they feel about that moment, and then we'll open up the questions to the audience because obviously there are some things that I'm sure everybody here would like to know. Um, for me especially when I think about it, and, and I think about being in college at the time, and I think I watched the game on a five-inch black-and-white TV <laughs> that my grandmother sent me. And, Was it HD know, back then? No. Uh, <laughs> there were no Twittering and, and whatever, but, you know, just that moment, you know, to a Yankee fan was, um, you know, just so gratifying. So I guess we'll start with, um, you know, with Bucky, who in, in that generation was really, you know, I guess the 70s uh, Derek Jeter, if you don't mind me saying. <laughs> so, uh, he, just, he just makes more money than I did. <laughs> um, so I guess there's two questions. Is what was it like being, you know, the Derek Jeter of the Yankees in the 70s? And, you know, what difference did making, uh, hitting that home run really change things? Well, the first question about, you know, Derek Jeter, of course, you know, he's a Hall of Famer, but, uh, you know, Coming over to the Yankees was my dream back then, and, and I got a chance to do that in 77 when I got traded over here. Uh, actually, I met Mr. Steinbrenner in 1973 at a Bulls basketball game. I was a rookie. At the end of the season, I went to a basketball game, and we were sitting like three or four rows behind the uh, Bulls uh, bench, and this gentleman walks in, and two guys that I was with said, do you know who that guy is right there? And I said, no. They go, that's the owner of the New York Yankees, George Steinbrenner. Would you like to meet him? I go, yeah, I'd love to meet him. So uh, they tapped him on the shoulder, and he turned around, and I introduced myself. I said, I'm Bucky Dent, shortstop for Chicago White Sox. And he goes, I've been trying to get you, son. Nice. Very nice. And so about four years later, I got a chance to, to be traded over in 77. And actually, Mike and I played together in 77. A lot of people don't remember, but he won two big games in the World Series. And, uh, you know, we were teammates. And uh, he uh, chose the next year, 78, to go to the Red Sox. And... Uh, you know, we played in that one-game playoff. But, uh, you know, being a part of Yankee history and being a part of uh, a big game like that uh, um, is uh, something very, very special. Uh, from Mike, and so it was something that we were talking about right before, uh, is really, I, I think, for everyone in the room that realizes how important uh, World Series and how it's so, so difficult to pitch down the stretch. And I think you're seeing that, you know, today with Tim Hudson. You're just seeing so many different players that are just having trouble, obviously, that handle those big games. And I don't think any Yankee has won two World Series games within one World Series since you did that. So I think I think that just shows you, and maybe you just want to expand on you know winning the two World Series games, and as well as you probably should have been uh, World Series MVP had somebody not hit. Dog <laughs> 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 on Reggie. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I started the season that year in Oakland, and. Uh, Charlie Finley, this is the mentality that Charlie had. He says to me, and I started off the season 3-0 with Oakland in 77. And at that time, my wife was pregnant, and then uh, he asked me, he said, well, Catfish had uh, signed a big contract with the Yankees. And he says to me, Mike, he says, I want to keep you, but I want to give you a three-year contract, 100000 125000 150. And I looked at him and I said, Charlie, you must be crazy. Well, I'm not staying here for that kind of money. I said, not with everybody getting a half a million dollars I see, you know, down the road. And, well, he said, if I can't sign you, I'm going to trade you. And I said, well, okay, go ahead. And I, you know, realized he was going to trade me. And then we were in Anaheim, and I was in the lobby, and Joe Romo, who was a trainer for the Oakland A's at that time, says to me, Mike, Charlie wants to talk to you. I get on the phone, hey, Charlie, how you doing? I says, good, Mike. He said, gee, I'm trying to offer you, give you this 
contract again? Will you take it? And they said, no, Charlie, come on. He said, okay, well, I've just traded you to the Yankees. <laughs> oh, okay. So I ended up coming here, and um, but it was uh, it was great. I mean, the guys that I played with here were, were beautiful. I didn't want to leave, but, of course, Boston offered me a seven-year guaranteed contract. And at that time, you know, I was like 31. I said I'd be probably 38 by the time I finished my contract. I ended up pitching all seven years uh, of that contract. But anyway, um, <coughs> going back, you know, and uh, I look back at that 77 season. A lot of people don't realize, though, I came in in the fifth game in Kansas City and how Kansas City scoreless for about six and a third, six and two-thirds, when Gidry started, and if we don't win that game, we're never in the World Series. No so question. I ended up uh, pitching and shutting out Kansas City because they had, they got off to a 4 to nothing lead, Bucky, I believe, yeah. Yeah. and they didn't score any more runs. We ended up winning that game 6-4. to four. And Sparky came in, I think, in the last inning, and uh, we rallied and got two more runs and won the game. But, you know, I did my job uh, and was really proud of it because I, I grew up in Topeka, Kansas, and I had like two busloads of families and friends there watching the game, and I know they was kind of split up, like they wanted to see the Royals win. And uh, I just, uh, getting on that bus, looking down at World Stadium and realizing what I just did, I said, man, I'm so proud because now we're going in to the World Series. You know, every player's dream is to get into the World Series. And we were gone, and I just helped the Yankees for us to get into the World Series in 77, and I win two games, complete games, against the Dodgers in games three and game six. So I was very happy. I was very happy to be a Yankee here for that one year. Well, actually, about a half hour ago when uh, Bucky and I were in the hallway, he basically said we were talking about your two wins. He's like, don't forget Kansas City. Yeah. We may not have even gotten there. So that really shows what a great moment, and that is a part. And those are the things that people forget, and those are the things where you might not have been in there. Uh, something we talked about, and I know people have been wondering about, where are the gold gloves? What happened? Gold gloves? I had led the American League three times in fielding, but uh, I didn't win any. Uh, 75, I led the American League in everything. Put outs, assists, everything, and they gave it to Belanger. And then in 80 and uh, 81, I think I did the same thing and uh, got beat out by Trammell. So it, uh, it's kind of like a political thing with, with winning a gold glove because when I was coaching in Texas in 99, uh, I had a first baseman who uh, I felt really, really bad about because he played like 125 games at first base and made three errors, and Raphael Palmero played 25, and he won a gold glove. And I felt so, so bad about that. So, you know, but that's one thing that I wanted to win so bad in my career was a gold glove, and uh, but I didn't get a chance to get it. Well, it's got to be political. David Wright has one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but Lee Stevens was the first baseman at uh, at Texas, and he, and he did a tremendous job at first base. Could pick balls out of the dirt, big guy, and uh, played really, really well. Was a part of us winning over there, but he didn't win it, and I kind of consoled him, told him that I should have won three yeah. two. <laughs> uh, well, um, one of the things that people always wonder about, because obviously it's gotten into our living rooms, is. When you sit with Moose and you sit with Bobby Richardson and they talk about 61 and 61, they talk about that movie and they're like there were so many things that just were not even close to, you know, the actual truth. How did you guys feel and did you ever watch any of the Bronx's burning? And was that an accurate depiction or? I didn't, was I didn't watch much of the Bronx's burning because I, I was there and I, you know, was a part of it and, and so was Mike, but I didn't really get a chance to watch much of it. I watched a few segments. I met the guy that played Thurman at uh, dinner uh, one night at uh, Ruth Chris at a, before an old-timers game. Uh, but I really didn't get a chance to watch a whole lot of it. And a lot of people said it was pretty good, other than the scenes that I saw, I just I, I thought it got a little crazy with some of the acting. But uh, I didn't see much of it. I don't know about Mike. You've had your eyes closed. Then. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, it was uh, – there was a lot of craziness with that year with the club. Uh, we had a lot of great guys, you know, Mickey, probably one of the funniest guys that, uh, that I ever met in baseball. He's a, he's a great teammate, but funny. Uh, we used to get on the bus. Of course, we come off the flight uh, going into the cities uh, feeling pretty tipsy. 
I'm having a few <laughs> cocktails on the plane because a lot of the guys didn't like to fly and we got a little loose and relaxed by having a few cocktails. And uh, a lot of things happened, you know, inside the clubhouse. And there was a lot of stuff that I was reading that, of course, I didn't know about that Billy and, you know, fighting with uh, George and, and, you know, all the little things that where the writers were getting this, a lot of the times I didn't know. And it was like, you know, are we, are we in the clubhouse? I'm, we're not seeing this. But the writers, a lot of the times, would just come up with some stories, and uh, it seemed like they were writing just, you know, to get the public to, to look at, at the craziness that, that year that we were doing. And uh, But it wasn't as bad as it seems. Uh, I mean, once we crossed the white lines, everybody came out to play. Uh, that's one thing that uh, I look back and, you know, with all the craziness that was there anyway, but once, you know, all the partying, that whatever happened, once we crossed that white line, the game started, and we were serious, and uh, we had a great team. The one thing I, 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 I think back when Mike and I played with the Yankee teams, and like you said, you know, we played with some great players, but we had some characters, guys that were fun to play with. I mean, uh, you know, it was fun to be around those guys and be a part of it because you never knew what was going to happen, and they, they – and you know, uh, we did things back then that guys couldn't can't do today because they have YouTube and you know the internet and stuff like that. But we we had we had a good bunch of guys that, that, that had a lot of fun and, and like you said. But when they crossed the line, they they played they played the game. Um, a few things happened in the last year or two, and baseball is obviously a passionate sport. It's an emotional sport. And people really, you know, when it comes to the Yankees, that's why this room is filled tonight. Uh, have to ask you about two things. Is one when they took <coughs> out the stadium, and the other is obviously the passing of George Steinbrenner this year. Well, first of all, the stadium, um, you know, I was at the stadium yesterday doing a, a corporate event, and we were doing it on the Legends level, and you kind of look out, and over there is like a big hole now, you know. And every time I look over there, I kind of get – like choked up because that's the place that I remember because that's where all my memories were, you know. So that place was very special, um, special to me. And actually, Mike and I went in there what, about a year ago yeah. uh, before they tore it down, and we did a thing uh, for the Bronx is Burning, to, a new segment for it. And when we walked in there, it was really weird because it was ghostly because all the seats were gone, mm -hmm. the grass was gone. And actually, I wanted to go down and take one final look at the clubhouse. They had the yellow tape on it, and some guys had walked down in there. And I started down there, and I said, nah, I want to remember it the way it was, you know. Uh, so we, I didn't go down in there. But that place was very, very special to, to me because that's, that's where all the memories were, and that's where, for me, all the great, the great players played. And what was the other question? Uh, the passing of George. Oh, the passing of George. I mean, uh, very sad. Um, actually, we got to go see him in January. We were doing a fantasy camp this past January in uh, Tampa. And Mike, myself, and Roy White, Mickey Rivers, uh, and Chris Chambliss, we went up to see him because they said he was having a very good day that day. And um, we kind of felt that it could have been the last time we ever seen him, and we were right. You know, yeah. We got up to go see him, and he was in good spirits. He remembered us all. He was laughing and joking around, and we all walked out there walked out of the room feeling really, really good because, you know, it was a good meeting. I mean, uh, and we all felt that could be the last time we see him, and it was. But he was a great owner. A lot of things went on. Um, you know, he's a guy that expected you to win when you went out there. He didn't want to take anything else other than uh, winning. Uh, very tough owner, but a guy that had a lot of passion and a lot of loyalty to his players. I mean, to his older players. He was very loyal to them. And uh, I just feel very fortunate that I have a chance to play for him. Mike, same two questions. Who was the stadium? <laughs> taking down the stadium. Uh, taking down the stadium, yeah. I mean, you know, I had, uh, you know, I caught the last out of the World Series. I can just, I can still visualize it when I was jumping up. Lee Lacey tried to bunt on me with, with Greg was playing, Nettles was playing back the third, and he wouldn't have never caught it. And I was just there, and I was with him on, and came down, and the fun that we had, the remembering the champagne and, you know, everything that night uh, after the World Series. And just the short time that I was there, I really, really enjoyed it. And that's why I tell players today, if you're able to play and you ever get traded to New York, New York really is the place to play. And it really is a great city. Fans love their baseball. Uh, if you're
you're successful there, you can play anywhere. And uh, as far as George Steinbrenner, I, there's a quick story. I, I, when I, there was one particular game against Detroit, I got knocked out uh, in that game. And I think you remember Billy or um, Bucky when Billy was hollering at me. Yeah, Tito Fuentes. <laughs> yeah, if you guys remember him, he's hollering on top of the dugout. Hit him. Hit him. It was Saturday game. It was a game. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he said, holler at me, hit him, hit him. Because he's hitting like 800 off of our pitching. <laughs> and I'm going, I, Tito Fuentes, I faced him in the National League when I was with uh, St. Louis and Montreal. <coughs> and he never hit me. And I'm saying, Billy, and he said, I said, there's two outs. Why am I going to wake everybody up? So anyway, I hit him. Tito was hollering at me, he says, you're racist, you're listening to that guy over there. <laughs> he said, Spanish, this is all in Spanish, I understand Spanish. And I said, and I was looking at him, and uh, he, was go he was going off, and he was mad because Billy was hollering at me, to hit him. I did hit him, so, and he took his base, and, you know, he says, uh, I can say it in Spanish, the guys are here that understand Spanish, uh, you know, uh, the word, uh, he was hollering at me, going your life, you know. <laughs> So anyway, uh, I got knocked. Anyway, they messed up my game, messed up my concentration. I got knocked out. Billy took me out. And I was mad, and I tore up the clubhouse with a bat. And I was leaving. <laughs> I was leaving. It was about the sixth inning. And Lord, and I'm waiting for the elevator. The door opens up. And who's there? George. Oh. And I had been struggling. Uh, so when I got there, we had seven or eight starting pitchers. George puts his arms around me. He says, where are you going? I said, I'm getting out of here. I'm going home. He said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, just tell me, you know, I come, you know, I traded for you to win me some games. What the heck's going on? I said, George, I said, you know, I come over here, and I said, Billy has, uh, we have seven or eight starters, you know. And I said, I've been used to pitching every fourth day. I said, I don't like pitching every seventh, eighth, ninth day, and that's what I've been getting here. And I just tell him my, how I felt because I'm not pitching like I thought I should have. Oh, well, you know, okay, well, I'll talk to Billy. Anyway, he reaches in his pocket, gives me $300, $100 bills here. Go have dinner with your wife. You have a good time. Get out of here. <laughs> so he was a great guy. He was a great owner. And then everybody's birthday, he sent a big magnum of champagne down to everybody. Uh, but, you know, little things that he did, you know, really enjoyed him. He was tough, like Bucky said. But uh, he wanted to win. And, I mean, he, he's the greatest owner that uh, one of the only, some of the owners, I played a lot of teams that you never really ever saw other owners come down like he did. And, but he got involved. He got involved with the Yankees and uh, you know, all the meetings that we had in the mornings. He used to wake us up because we were in three games. We had a meeting, you know, everybody come half dressed into a conference room at the hotel. And we would all be sitting there like, looking, come on, George. <laughs> He'd be talking. And, but he, as far as uh, him being a great guy, I, I liked him. And, uh, you know, he was a great, great owner uh, to play for. That year in 77, Mike was talking about, it was my first year over there. And, at the, at the All-Star break, he had a big meeting in Kansas City. We were six games behind the Red Sox. And he comes down there and gets everybody in the meeting. And he gets up there and he goes, okay. He says, listen, let me tell you guys something right now. You got no chance of catching the Red Sox. You're six games behind them. He says, but you're putting asses in the seat. He says, so here's $300. Go have a good time at the All-Star break and don't embarrass yourself the second half. <laughs> and we come back and won. Wow. Uh, Obviously, uh, last year for Lou Pinella managing, uh, did you? Uh, what are your memories of, of Sweet Lou from, you know, another character of that team, and, and, and could you imagine him being one of the most, uh, you know, managing in the sport for? Probably one. Years of, probably one of the funniest guys I've ever played with. I mean, a very intense guy playing, uh, but a fun guy to play with and a funny guy to play with. Uh, um, you know, sometimes you'd be standing at shortstop, and all of a sudden you hear the crowd yell or something, a roar, you turn around and Pinella had thrown a tennis ball at somebody in Kansas City in right field, you know, I mean, but he used to scream at pitchers, I mean, one of his things that he used to do, left-handed pitchers that threw soft, he used to get on the dugout step and scream at them, you know, and there was a guy named uh, Zahn, he's pitch from Minnesota, and, and he would get up there, and, and you could always tell Lou if his first at bat, how it went, well, you know, we're in Minnesota, and guy throws him a changeup. He grounds out or something. He comes walking back to the dugout and he starts <laughs> screaming at him, "Throw me a fastball, you girl!" You know. <laughs> and so, next to that, you go up there and 
guy throw him a fastball and he'd get a base hit and he'd come back in there and you know he'd go, ah, ha, ha, what a dummy he is. <laughs> <laughs> he threw me a fastball, but Lou was a fun guy, very intense guy, and um, and uh, I really enjoyed playing him. One of the best hitters, clutch hitters that uh, that we had on our team at the time. It was a lot of fun. As far as managing, um, I really didn't think that he was going to be the kind of manager he was. Uh, I didn't know if he had the personality for it, but he did uh, did it for a long time. Was very very successful, and uh, uh, he reminded me a lot of Billy managing. You know, Mike, Sweet Lou, Sweet Lou from <laughs> Peru. No, Lou was a great player, and uh, you know, like the Buckley said, he, he was one of the funniest guys on the on the bus rides uh, coming in, come, you know, coming into the hotel. And I can always remember the thing. One of his habits was I used to laugh. I always see him. He he pick his hair. He always pick his hair and look at it and, and smell it. <laughs> yeah, that was his habit. That's what I remember about Lou. Twist his hair and sniff it. Yeah, he used to know. pick his hair. And, Look at it and sniff it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was always doing it. He was always doing it. So that's what I remember about Lou. And as far as managing, yeah, no, he did a, a great job. Went out to Seattle. And uh, like what he said, I didn't know how he was going to be, but, you know, with his tantrum. But, uh, you know, he, he let guys know. Uh, it seemed like, you know, when I, I live in Naperville, Illinois now, but I've been watching him uh, coach with the uh, manage the Cubs. And I could see where he. Kind of the press was in the first couple of years there. He, Lou could not do anything wrong. And this year, starting off the season, while well, they were starting to get into him, you can see where he kind of like he didn't like being talked about like that by his conversations. And uh, and then I think he just like he said, I think he got fed up with having to read about that. And uh, of course, they, you know they have the Cup players. They had they had a tough time this year. They, they had some guys that were hurt early. They got in the hole and they just couldn't get out of it. But uh, he did a great job and I enjoyed playing with Luke. We had a lot of fun. Uh, can't tell you all the personal stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. The bus, um, the bus yeah. rides, I got to say, uh, on those teams in uh, you know, 77, we probably, everybody wanted to get on the bus after the game because the bus rides were hilarious. I mean, if you screwed up in the game, don't get on the bus <laughs> because they would eat you alive. And, uh, sometimes it would be a day game and we'd be riding to, to the uh, airplane and it'd be real quiet. You know, everybody would be kind of tired, you know, and everybody would be kind of, the bus would be kind of quiet and all of a sudden you would hear catfish because catfish and Lou used to go at it. You know, catfish would go, uh, hey Lou, how's your hair smell? <laughs> That's all it took. Saying, ah, you farmer. He said, you know, everybody drives Mercedes, you drive a tractor. <laughs> but it, that's, that's how it was back then. I mean, a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience at this point. Uh, right there. Uh, question from both of you. Just throughout your careers, if you could share with us, Mr. Dent, the, the toughest pitcher that you ever faced, and Mr. Torres, the toughest hitter you ever faced. Uh, the toughest pitcher was Nolan Ryan for me. I mean, uh, Nolan was a mean guy, and he threw hard. And he didn't mind throwing at you. And they used to do this little kind of like war dance thing right out in front of home plate before uh, before he pitched. He would kind of like walk out in front, kind of stomp the grass, like, you know, checking it out, like letting you know, don't don't be trying to bunt on me, you know. And uh, But he was he was a guy that, uh, that could intimidate you, and he threw hard. And uh, he was probably one of the toughest guys I'd face. There was a lot of really good pitchers back then. Um, so, but as far as that... Uh, the best hitter that I, the toughest hitter for me uh, was Rod Carew with Minnesota Twins. He was tough. Once you get two strikes on him, he'd like shorten up his stroke. And you know, I remember one time I throw like eight or nine pitches, and when I, once I made that one mistake, he was wrapping me for a double. I said, yeah. and I said, because once you got ahead of him on the count, he just like I said, he shortened up his stroke, and he didn't have that full swing. He just didn't try to. Just struck out off. rarely. And rarely, yeah. Very rarely did he have a strikeout. He and, uh, you know, Pete Rose. Pete Rose was also uh, one of the toughest hitters uh, to get out. Uh, they all tough to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, all the way in the back. Mike, when are you coming back to White Plains? I'm here in White Plains. <laughs> I'm back in Fort. I haven't seen you in a while. 
seen in a while. Little League's been missing you. Yeah? How's the Little League doing this? Oh, this year was a good turnout. Great, great. Yeah, I was happy because I started the Little League in White Plains. Uh, yes, we did. only had, like, had one team. Now they have, like, 11, 100, 1,200, 1,300 kids. Yeah, this year was a great year. Yeah, because when 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 after I started playing it, Tom Pasqua and myself, <laughs> we started something. And we got the first four teams, and then we started. We had the girl, you know, the girls <coughs> come in, and they built up a nice program in White Plains. I was very happy to see that all the time. Thank you. Okay. Who else? A question? Go ahead. Mike, what was the, uh, what umpire was your favorite? Uh, you know who, who, who was a good uh, strike umpire was Ron Luciano. He gave you the outside pitch out there, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I know hitters didn't like him. I, I, he didn't have a, a small strike zone. He had a wide strike zone. So he was one of the, the toughest umpire was Harvey, uh, Doug Harvey. Doug, Doug Harvey had a strike zone like this and like, this. I mean, you throw it in there. It was a ball. And Gibby, and I broke in with the Cardinals, and Bob Gibson hated him. He used to holler at uh, Doug, God, you know, damn it. He says, you got to start giving me those pitches. And Doug would put, you know, put his mask up and watch Gibby walk all the way to the mound. So I'm going to give it to you. You throw it right where I want it. <laughs> and then, you know, it gets get tough with Gibby. And that's the way we start talking. Don't anybody say anything to this guy when he was back in don't say anything. He was one of the toughest umpires, Doug Harvey. Any other questions? Lucky, um, one past and one present Yankee that you idolize. Um, my favorite when I was growing up was Mickey Mantle. He was my hero. Um, he was a guy that, uh, you know, all the kids and you know in the neighborhood when you got in the backyard and you're playing wiffle ball, you know, everybody wanted to be Mickey Mantle. Uh, the guy that I like the way he plays the game right now is Jeter. Uh, you know, people ask me, you know, who would you like your son to be like? And I said, Derek Jeter. I just like what he does, the way he carries himself on and off the field as a professional, and uh, what he does. I, I like the way he plays. Okay, we'll take two more, and we'll get the show on the road. Any uh, pregame rituals you guys have? Yeah, I used to jump over the foul line all the time with a, my right foot, and I kind of went to one spot in the first inning, and then the second, third innings, I did something different. But, yeah, I had a little little ritual I did. Well, the days I started, as I'm saying, I, I don't understand the pitchers today. I threw 130, 140 pitches warming up before our game even started. And then I throw the eight and nine in between the innings and then throw another 160, 70 in the innings. Yeah, what's up? Arm still feels What's up? What happened? It'll build them. It'll build them like they used to. <laughs> Okay. No, I, I tell you, because when I came up, we came up to the big leagues, pitchers, if you could not go nine, you were not count. You were not a starting pitcher. All right. You couldn't go nine. Right. You, uh, first major league start uh, with the Cardinals that pitched against the Atlanta Braves. And uh, Dale Maxwell, our shortstop, says to me, I, well, I was winning the game three to one. And Red Chambies, our manager at the time, took me out. He said, well, I pitched a great game. And I said, well, Red, I'm okay. I'm all right. That, you know, let Ray Washburn come in because I took his spot. He was a starting <coughs> pitcher for the Cardinals uh, for many years, and I took, ended up taking his spot when I first came up. And Ray Washburn came in and gave up a two-run home run to Cleet Boyer to tie the game. And after the game, we ended up losing four to three. And uh, Maxwell, I think he says, comes to me, Rook, next time you tell Chavis you stay in here, next time you go nine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, you've got to, you got to, as a starting pitcher, you had to be, you had to go nine. They expected nine. You go in for contract. Well, you, you only, you had 12, 14 wins, yeah, but you only completed two games <laughs> back then. Yeah. Last question. Mike, how was it pitching to Thurman once in, in 77, then Carlton Fist the next year? Oh, I love Thurman, you know, because I, I, I love pitching fast. And uh, Carlton, I went to the Red Sox. I, I mean, I'm saying because uh, here, here was a, a quick story. And I don't remember this, Bucky, but uh, in Cleveland, uh, Billy had given Thurman the night off. It's a Sunday game. Thurman went out and had a few cocktails, enjoyed himself, knowing he wasn't going to catch. Lord behold, Billy had him in the lineup the next morning. <laughs> he comes in, still kind of hung over. He says, uh, I'm in the training room, kind of, you know, relaxing. And he comes in there all red-eyed and tells me, and he says, 
I can't believe you told me I absolved you today. And he asked me back on the line. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, he was, he was upset. So he's looking. He said, Mike, you're fishing today? He says, look, I'm so messed up. I can't even think what to call it. Just throw it and I'll catch it. <laughs> but then, and I, the next year I go with, to Carlton Fisk. I had after about the second game, you know, Carlton was like so slow. I mean, he had his man. And, <laughs> and he was a tall catcher, like myself. And finally he started getting down. <laughs> and I'm ready to go, ready to go. After the first two starts, I said to him, Carlton, I said, they're scored faster. I don't want to keep pitching four hour games here. Man. It takes so long. Before he got mad at me, I said, come on. Okay, well, I'll go. I said, I like this fast. I don't like messing around. I said, just get down, let's go. I said, you know, what are you you're letting the hitters think? What you know? I hate to let the hitters think. I just grab it and let's go. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, thank you very much. It was very enjoyable. Let's have a, a big round. Of applause.